Hi, I'm Josh, and I'm a white guy who grew up in Orange County, California. And I'm Jerome, a black guy who grew up in Orange County, but moved to Northern California. And we were high school teammates. 30 years later, Jerome and I have reconnected. And while we still consider ourselves friends, our viewpoints differ on a lot of different topics. But what we don't differ on is that people can still get along and have civil conversations. Even about serious and emotional topics. Since I grew up in a white neighborhood, most of my friends were white or other races. So I said to Jerome, hey, let's do a show about things white people say and prove to people that you can have a civil, engaging, and oftentimes educational discussion. And most importantly, we both agree that racism isn't political. So we promised each other we would keep politics out of the show. That's part of our plan to show everyone that these conversations can be positive. So send us your topics. And we'll do our best to discuss the things that you hear white guys say. Welcome back to Things White Guys Say. Uh, Jerome, uh, man, this is our fourth show. How are you feeling about it so far, buddy? Feeling good? Feeling good, man. I just love tackling these topics. I love discussing with you things that, you know, normally people can't discuss. Yeah, I think that's really one of our goals, right? It's just to keep this top of mind. And that's actually going to be one of the topics of our show today, which is we just came up when we taped this. It's November 2020, we just came off a very contentious uh, presidential election. And so Jerome and I said, hey, you know, we've been talking about it for months, but um, how do we keep the topic of our show and the things we're trying to do relevant in non-election year? So I have some questions for Jerome today on those things. I want to, uh, a couple of times on our show, we start with kind of a memory of Jerome and I in high school. I didn't even prep him for this. So Jerome, you and I did an air band competition in high school where we were two of the five uh, singers from a boy band. You want to share with people what the name of that boy band was in 1990? Oh my God. All right. <laughs> I think that was the new kids on the block. N-K-O-T-B. But here's the bigger question. I know who I was because oh. I was the fifth to join. And you guys were like, you're the lead singer, dude. So I was uh, Donnie Wahlberg wearing the homeboy shirt. Do you remember which one you are? I got no idea. No, I, I don't either. I just thought I'd ask, man. So I, I don't even remember which song we did. Yeah, Maybe yeah. Hanging so, Tough. Hanging, hanging tough. tough. That's right. We were waving our arms in the air. And guys, just so you know, I don't want to, first of all, I like some of their music. Those guys have gone on to some successful careers. I think Donnie Wahlberg uh, does a successful TV show. His brother's certainly done well. Um, but um, uh, just to be clear, I don't think any of the five of us were like true, like huge NKOTB fans or even no. small fans, right? I no. think we did it more to, to have some fun with it and uh, just kind of go out our senior year with the bank. So that's kind of our flashback moment of the day, but on to more serious topics. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we want to engage and educate. And um, so here's my first question for you today, Jerome. Is it frustrating to you as a, as a U.S. history teacher, as an African-American history teacher, and as an African-American, um, that the media only seems to cover um, systematic racism, racial inequality, only seems to be a, a, a key featured media story during election years? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, interesting question. Um, let me start with this. I think what's beautiful about the idea of the contentious election is the topic we're talking about has nothing to do with politics. You know, it's not an us versus them. This is a, a discussion about inequality in this country, and that isn't political. That's, you know, people who believe in equality and those who don't, you know. It's so probably it's the hardest thing about our show, right, is we agreed not to make it political, but so often it comes back to how people are yeah. leveraging it politically yeah. that you and I work really hard not to. So go ahead, continue. So I would beg to differ in, in just in the statement that it, to me, the media doesn't bring it up every election year. The media brings it up when it's lucrative for the media to bring it up. The, the media brings it up when there's a police killing and they run 24 hours back and forth about what happened. If there is a, you know, a, a racial incident in a country, the media brings it up, but it's not correlated to election years. The groups that I believe bring it up during election years are actually our two mainstream political parties. And that does frustrate me. 
the Democrats seem to focus on racial equality in the eight months leading up to the election and then do very little to, to address it in the, in the years following the election. And the Republicans tend to use it as more of a divisive issue to gain votes within their group. And so to me, I just, I, I don't think that it, it, it's addressed in our country properly by any institution. I'm killing my microphone because as you know, you guys, this is a family show and I got two dogs in the family here and the, the next door neighbor has some tree trimmers here and there's college football on in the backyard. And so I'm trying to fight all the family elements here. So uh -oh. forgive me if it takes a second to chime in afterwards. So I think those are really good points, Jerome. Um, so, so let me ask you another question because this is really where you and I started back in the summer of 2020 when, you know, you and I talked a few times since high school, but really hadn't invested a whole lot of time and, and, and really the heart of what you were saying is, is Josh, why aren't you and other Caucasians more outraged by the George Floyd and some of the other things that Breonna Taylor, some of the things that are going on? Why haven't I seen, I think your statement on Facebook was, why don't I see um, anybody other than African-Americans being outraged by this, uh, these two incidents? So the question I want to put in generic terms, not targeting Caucasians, not targeting anybody else, mm -hmm. but just to say, hey, is it understandable well, it is understandable that someone not impacted by an issue, any issue, whether it's wealth or racism or or anything else, when it's not something you deal with every day, it's not something you prioritize in your life usually, right? So how would you suggest, meaning Caucasians have never had the, to deal with um, racial inequality, systematic racism. You give so many great examples of that on the, um, the bonus shows of my old podcast that kind of launched this show. Uh, how you grew up white, but then when you kind of uh, had kids and moved to a white neighborhood, because you're African American, you were getting pulled over, you were getting treated differently. And, and it's something that we could never as Caucasians really understand. You had some really good examples. I think one of my favorite was when you and your sister, who's Caucasian, went to the store together with kids and you told your kid to put the toy away because, you know, you can't have a toy in the store. And she said, no, it's okay. And you basically said, it's not okay. Trust me, because I'm, we're African-American. Mm -hmm. So that was the really short version of that story. But it was stories like that that made me say, really opened my eyes to, well, wow, you know, Jerome's right because he lives it. How can we as Caucasians prioritize systematic racism? So here's the short version of the question. How would you suggest those not impacted by systematic racism prioritize it so it's not just top of mind every four years when the media and social media, as a, as a result, hammer at home constantly? Okay. Um, let, let me start with this with this one little statement that we're not talking about equality in the sense that everyone gets an equal share of everything. I get that. I'm not, I'm not for that. I'm not for everyone getting everything equally. What we're talking about is the idea that everybody has equal opportunity to have success in this country. That the color of your skin does not determine your ability to have success, that your gender doesn't determine. That's, that's what we're talking about. And that's been historically a truth in our country since 1776. So I would say this, I would say to all those that call themselves Americans, that says that they believe in the ideology of America, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that everyone has an opportunity to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, if, if you're an American, then you believe in those ideas. And, and if, if you can see that those ideas are not being played out, that our country does, that that should be something that effectively matters to you, that you want this nation to be the nation it intended to be. And I think that's really important um, that I think in 2020 more than ever, uh, I know for me, I think the first time I ever heard someone that I knew uh, and grew up with to be you know, a great person, a good citizen say, well, yeah, Josh, I'm proud to be American, but there's part of me that isn't proud at all to be an American because of what you know, some, some others have experienced in, in um, and that was, uh, honestly, that throws you back. And I still have Caucasian friends that when they hear that, they go, they just, well, well they, you don't have to be, you know, the kind of reaction is off the yeah. cuff, but when you take a deep breath and you, and you kind of sit back and go, well, I can understand why. Um, and it, it really comes back to the whole stand or kneel. Not, it doesn't come back to that, but it's, it's kind of closely parallel to that whole deal, right? Well, you don't have to be right or wrong. You just have to understand that other people have had a different experience than you have had. So, so go ahead, Jerome, you have some say. 
that's a huge statement that you just said. I can understand why. It's not you saying you agree. It's not you saying that, you know, you, you um, feel the same way. It's you saying that you can understand. And I think once we begin to, that, uh, once we say that we can understand, we can begin to empathize with that. And we can begin to see the problems as opposed to being the person that says, if you don't like it, get out. Sure. You know, I think that's the, the transformation that a lot of Caucasians I spoke to in 2020 um, started to realize. And I think your point is right on. They didn't necessarily have to agree, but to be willing to say, I can understand why others would see it differently. And I'm trying to educate myself on some of the perspectives that led to their belief so I can maybe reconsider my perspective on it. Perfect. I mean, that, that to me, you couldn't explain it any better than that. And, and again, that's why these discussions, you know, we don't have these discussions ahead of time. We, we don't talk about these things. These are on air right now, us going back and forth. And I, I literally believe that if people can just sit down and talk and listen, that you can begin to see. And I'm not asking you, you know, when you said you had somebody said, I don't like America sometimes. No one's asking you to say that. No one wants you to say, I don't like America too, because Jimmy doesn't like him. But to be able to understand why Jimmy doesn't allows you to be able to see what maybe needs to change in this country so that everybody can love it and everybody can be a part of it. Yeah, uh, I think um, those are some really good points. And I, I'm hopeful that now that the election's over, the kind of, you know, pick A or B or left or right is the term they use in the media. Like it, it's so like dig your heels in and entrenched in every single opinion that it, I think above all else, what you and I are trying to demonstrate is you can discuss these things. And, and guys, look, if you listen, you know, Sean and I don't hardly agree on a lot when it comes to politics. And you can see that if you listen close <laughs> enough, but that's okay. We love each other. We're buddies. We, we both uh, want what's good for everybody, yeah. but we're just trying to have a better understanding of, of where the other comes from. And I think we've both grown a lot as a result of that. So Hey, um, Drum, you used a term when we were talking about, hey, what are we going to do on the next show? And I said, hey, I, I'm really like, what about, you know, how do we talk about the election without talking about the election? And we decided on like the media only seemed to prioritize this, you know, in election years. And our goal is to keep it top of mind and get people to discuss and engage and educate. So you used a term called lawfully equal, which is semi self-explanatory. But um, can you explain to me kind of from your perspective, what you shared with me about lawfully equal and why it kind of came up in this conversation you and I were having? Yeah, um, so as a history teacher and specifically, you know, I do US history and African American history and it comes up a lot more in my African American history course. Um, this idea of things being lawfully equal and people being okay with it being lawfully equal. So we can go back to any point in history, and I'll use a couple examples. We can go to the 13th Amendment. You know, the 13th Amendment banned slavery, which made technically the economic side of America equal. Blacks had an equal chance to make money under the law, all those kind of things. Now, the reality is a system called sharecropping took over that reinstituted technically legalized slavery. So lawfully, it looked like with the 13th Amendment, everything was okay, but it wasn't. A few years later, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 is passed, which banned discrimination. And as you know, we passed a law again in 1964 that banned discrimination again. So lawfully equal only matters if one, it's being enforced by somebody, and number two, the issues that happened before have been addressed. I use, I always use this analogy and this will be a good one for you. We play a game five on five. Okay. You start the first quarter with five guys. I start with one. Okay. You build a nice 25 to three lead on me in the second quarter. You let me have uh, another guy. So I have two now and I close the gap a little bit, but it's 50 to 22 third quarter. I get to add two more. So now it's five on four. And now I cut the lead to 15 or 14. And then in the fourth quarter, you let us play five on five and you state out loud, everything's equal. Let's see what happens. You know, you end up winning the game by seven and we go, wow, that team's the better team. They really did well, you know? And so, and that's really, I mean, really that's America in a nutshell. And so we never addressed all those past issues. So lawfully equal is great today, 
but just starting from today doesn't work because that's throwing out all of history that led to that moment. Your co-host Josh Luke here. And if you like what you're hearing, then check out our not-for-profit website at timeforredemption.org. Timeforredemption.org was created so Caucasians and other races have a platform to lean into for the social justice movement. It's not political, guys. It's not even controversial. It's just human. It's a movement. Uh, that provides resources, tools, whatever you might need for individuals, corporations, and communities that may not be comfortable with the existing social justice organizations. So if, if this sounds good to you guys, check out time for the number four redemption.org and just join in and do your part to end systematic and institutionalized racism. Hey, I did it, folks. You can too. And I think it goes back to the point that you made earlier that it's not necessarily that everybody's entitled to the same things, but that everybody has an equal opportunity. And I, I took from that um, the word opportunity. Uh, and, you know, I, as sometimes when Jerome and I are talking and I'm listening to him, I write down other show topics. And it seems to me that now every time I watch a new show, that Hollywood is continuing to... Um, push the racial stereotypes of old and gender race it's like and so i think we'll do a different show on that because if hollywood keeps pushing that it's like how can everybody else and i'm not talking about how they talk about it off screen i'm talking about in the movies these every time you look up um you're seeing that and so Joe, i was really encouraged by um i'm a huge dodger fan i want to address hey uh we just uh, won the world series a few weeks ago so Finally got that uh, off our backs. First time since Jerome and I were in high school, but <laughs> their player Mookie Betts, African-American from Tennessee uh, has done so much for this community, for the Nashville community and was among the players who um, really spoke out and said, we're not willing to play unless major league baseball allows us to do some of these things. And uh, so I think Jerome and I potentially can do um, a, a show on, on some of that activism as well later on, but Jerome, Talk about what it, what it, what, what impact in your mind, and, and again, not political, but what impact have the Mookie Betts of the world and some of these other athletes that, and for Major League Baseball guys, if you don't know, what happened there a little different than the very public NBA stuff was they all, uh, all the African American players created a, a text chain and it grew and grew and grew. And we're kind of just, they had a group where they were all saying, hey, we won't take the field, you don't take the field, do things like that. But Joan, what do you what do you think? Um, what should we focus on out of that? Because everybody wants to politicize it. Everybody wants to say I do or I don't agree. And now that the political season's over, and I can sit back and say, man, Mookie's one of the greatest guys I've ever seen, as far as I can tell. What should I take from? And every team has somebody who might be doing the same. So what should I take from that? What would you encourage me to focus on? I'm I'm very simple when it comes to that. I, I think that people who sacrifice their own well-being for the betterment of society, I got respect for them. You know, and, and may, I may not even agree with the issue, whether it's, um, uh, uh, I hate when I forget his name, Pat Tillman, yeah. who gave up a million dollar contract and went and fought in the Iraq war. You know, there's somebody, that's a commitment. These guys who sacrifice millions upon millions of potential dollars in the name of doing what they believe is morally right, I got respect for them. And I think that, that, that those voices, you know, the people who say just shut up and dribble and play basketball, don't understand how the world works. You know, the world works by us using our voices to better it. Whether, you know, and I'm not talking about which ideology, whatever it is, I'm just saying, sure. I appreciate those people who put themselves out on a limb for the greater good of others. And that's, to me, Mookie Betts, that's who he is. Just like that's who LeBron James is, that's who, you know, uh, Chris Paul is, anybody who does it. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because I didn't know much about Mookie when he came here from uh, Boston, but man, I'm so glad he's a Dodger. He's gonna be a Dodger for 10 years. He's just an all around great dude. And he had an immediate impact in the clubhouse and in the community. And I saw in Nashville, he's back in Nashville and they were, he was doing stuff there. So, hey, Jerome, let's wrap up in the next few minutes here with kind of our challenge for folks like we normally do. Um, this show, as you know, um, this episode originally premiered the same week that we launched our show back in November of 2020. We kind of publicly launched it. You could have found some shows before that uh, just because we were kind of working out the website kinks and things like that. But our challenge for this week is we would love for each listener, everybody who listens to this, just to share it. Just click on 
on our website and, and share it. Uh, just you know, copy the website address, the URL, whatever you call it, paste it into a Facebook message and say, hey, my, my history teacher, Jerome, or my old buddy, Jerome, or my buddy, Josh, or whatever, is, are doing the show. They're taking on controversial issues and doing it in a civil manner. What else would you like them, in addition to just sharing it, what would you like them in just a one sentence uh, social media post to share about what we're trying to accomplish? To me, what's important about what we're doing is that we're allowed to engage in this dialogue and we're allowed to kind of share ideas with one another. And I think it's important that, that people who care about the issue find people who maybe don't have the issue at the forefront and they're able to kind of start thinking about that issue a little bit more. Okay. And I think that's fair. And guys, um, you can hashtag on there things white guys say. That's the name of our show. Uh, it's on YouTube. And if you just want to do audio only, it's going to be on all major podcast uh, outlets and on our website. And also you can go to the not-for-profit that we're still kind of getting off the ground. And that's at timeforredemption.org. And that's the number four, timeforredemption.org. And we're still in the process of kind of getting together how we can serve communities and organizations, corporations, and just helping them eliminate systematic racism. So Jerome, great topic, great show. Uh, anything else you want to share right before we sign off? Nope, I'm enjoying this. All right, but thanks so much. We'll talk again All right. soon. All right, man. Okay, I'm going to end this and then I'll click back in. I don't know, it's, I think that I end recording. Yeah, it says recording still. I know that's weird and I just, it might click off. If so, just uh, zoom back in. Thanks for tuning in to Things White Guys Say. We encourage you to follow our show on YouTube and podcast networks. Like the show and share this episode with a friend. And visit our website at thingswhiteguyssay.com or drop us a line at info at thingswhiteguyssay.com.